Hello everyone. In this lecture 21, I show you how our previous earlier observation of uh, non question stress relaxation from step shear uh, could allow us to predict that uh, uh, delayed wall slip can also take place. After that, I'll move on to chapter 13, which focuses on a parallel set of phenomena regarding step extension and showing you that uh, uh, localized elastic yielding also takes place. Uh, after a brief uh, discussion about FSR, how, the, how it conducts a stress relaxation experiment, I will spend most of my time on updating the content of this chapter uh, in terms of a new experiment where the localized yielding uh, is observed in a confined uh, case uh, that is uh, uh, basically achieved through squeezing. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's try to uh, remember what we have done recently. We have been on the subject of uh, step extension and watch what happens after a large enough step extension. Apparently, the sample breaks apart. Uh, when the extension is sufficiently large. And uh, last time I updated you with a case where the, the extension was protected by confinement so that uh, the sample will not, fall, will not fail, uh, yet we can still observe uh, localized uh, disentanglement, if you like. So, uh, I just have a couple of uh, uh, message to, to indicate. Uh, after my lecture, I went back to uh, double check on one issue, which is what I mentioned but not copied uh, to the slides about how FSR was doing for stress relaxation. Okay, So this is in the book, but I didn't copy it the slides last time. This is the figure from the book. It shows that the way they did step extension was, of course, the length increases, the diameter decreases, and this is the point they stop the extension, okay? Since this sample is inherently uh, 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 eager to break, and if they start to break, this middle part will become narrower. In order to keep this middle part not changing, they move their cross head backward so that the lens becomes shorter. And this is what I commented last time as a remarkably different type of uh, stress relaxation than textbook type of stress relaxation. Okay? So this is the original paper. Uh, published in 2008. As I indicated last time, around the, that same time, we start to demonstrate that if you really do a textbook type of stress relaxation, you watch it, the sample actually will break apart. Okay? So, uh, having heard about that, the same author subsequently produced a paper using simulation to show, oh, indeed, sample will break apart. All right? So I think what's interesting is the same author did not speak anything about what they did in 2008 in terms of how to reinterpret what they have done. Okay, I just thought I should mention. Uh, there was also one small correction I should uh, indicate. What I talked about uh, last time about... Uh, a group using six models to show necking. That was a study during startup. That's the topic of uh, uh, chapter 11. During extension, our experiment also uh, indicate that, not also, in fact, very important point, that the startup extension does not produce steady flow state. As you stretch, it will break. And there was a numerical simulation using six models showing all six models give you 
making and break. Uh, but I mentioned about this sixth model and that paper in the context of step strand. So I better uh, make a correction by saying the same group actually also did step strand using three models, not six models. And they also uh, uh, claim to have observed this uh, instability. So this is all just uh, supplementary to what uh, I covered uh, previously. I, I'm, I'm uh, eager to move on. and. Uh, in particular, I'm eager to move on to the next uh, uh, topic. It's a very small, a very short par uh, uh, chapter, but there are a few things that uh, I try to hammer, you know, very clearly about it. So this is also a great opportunity for us to learn or to repeat ourselves, as we have done many times in the past about what is a linear response. OK, so let me copy that diagram from the book. And let me try my best to uh, indicate to you what is linear response. I must have said it uh, half a dozen times. Linear response largely means you have done something. When I say you have done, you mean, I mean you deform your system. Somehow, you deform it in a way that the structure is left intact. You don't destroy the structure. And that really means you have used a shear or extension that is sufficiently small. So the way to guarantee linear response is to avoid, I can start to write it now, avoid force imbalance. I know we, I have verbally said this a few times. Soon, in chapter 6, we will talk about this in great details. Uh, basically, avoid a chance for too much deformation in the red chain as a result of black chains holding it and try to stretch it. So if you don't stretch a lot, this white red chain remain happy, meaning remain happily hooked with other chains, and nothing will happen. But the only time things happen is diffusion. That takes reputation time. So at least empirically, conceivably, there will be a strand below which nothing happens. OK? I have said this very many times. And let's also observe a case where elastic breakdown occurs. We know in both shear and extension, when the strand is large enough, in chapter 9 and chapter 11, shear and extension, if the step strand is too large, no, sorry, let me, let me not, not even use the word step strand. If the, if the strand is too large, it will break. Uh, the, I, I hope here, you know, my, when I misspoke, I also give you a chance to realize what I'm talking about. Uh, if you don't urge yourself to stop, right, your shear could be doing this. Let's just take a case of shear as an example. And, uh, uh, let me just be very, very careful about what I, I am talking about here. So suppose, of course, you use a Wenzmer number quite large so that you are able, you are capable of elastically deforming your uh, polymer significantly. And we know that this is the indication structure breaks up. And this is, uh, uh, there is a possibility for you to see shear bending here. And uh, this is uh, this involved a continuous sh shear experiment. I think the topic I'm talking about in chapter uh, six, uh, 14 is largely about uh, step deformation, stepwise deformation. Okay. So, which means uh, 
Against this background, I'm going to terminate my share here. And what I was trying to tell you is that we have shown that if this uh, termination is at a value larger than some critical value, then you see non-question relaxation, right? Non-question relaxation in here. In extension, you see basically elastic breakup. Elastic, elastic breakup, if you like. Uh, so, so this diagram just shows somehow for some physics that we have yet to discuss, as soon as you deform sufficiently large, the structure if may I use the language of entanglement network, will break apart. And you may have, uh, as a result of disentanglement. I know that disentanglement is a concept, at least we are familiar with it in the limit of uh, wall slip. So we know in that limit what breakup means, uh, uh, entang disentanglement means. It is, they disengage, the blue chains and black chains disengage. And that, that can occur in the bulk as well. That's why we're uh, advocating. Um, so, this two extreme, I think we know. When the deformation is large enough, sample breaks apart. Keep in mind, I don't want to confuse you, but keep in mind, for shear, there is a condition of B over H not being too small. That's necessary to see breakup. In extension, we don't have such a criteria. Okay, apparently in extension, if there is a horse race, there is no, nothing to prevent you from saving the sample from breaking. So this limit is what we talked about, as I said. Uh, uh, I, I guess I had a little bit, uh, I have misspoken a little bit here when I speak about chapter 9 and 11. 9 and 11 all was dealing with startup deformation. In other words, you deform without stopping. And we see failures such as uh, uh, shear bending or the sample start to break apart at some point in extension. Uh, but I quickly corrected myself that this topic in chapter 14 is mostly about step extension and step shear. So basically, we are not uh, going to worry about uh, 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 these topics. We are talking about basically chapter 12 and 13. There we witnessed in both shear and extension, after sufficient large amount of step strength, sample break apart. So that's this limit. And I just mentioned there's other, the other limit very interesting, called the linear response limit. And it was perceived by us that there is a middle ground. There is a uh, amount of deformation not so large, but not so small. Where uh, you would not have linear response. On the other hand, you would not see failure either. Okay, so I know pictorially I just indicated this is a full disentanglement, all the disentanglement, uh, all the entanglement disappears, whereas here some disentanglement take place, other entanglement still survives. Uh, but let me go uh, through this concept a little bit, uh, uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, this is uh, quite crucial a concept. As a result, I singled it out as a single chapter of uh, chapter uh, 14. So, uh, so let me be uh, gentle and, and tell you what, uh, what uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, observed here. So we, uh, we, we only do step strength, okay? So you have a, you have your shear, 
And our son, then you're going to make a little step here, right to there, and then you hold it. And you know, when you do such a thing, rather boring, you're basically you are watching how your stress changes over time. If this is the strain you have, you find the linear response limit is a limit where this over this is a constant, independent of gamma. You can think about the same thing for extension. So there will be a, um, in general, if you use rubber elasticity as a guideline, there is a, uh, you can write it this way for extension. And uh, F, if you believe in rubber elasticity, is of the form of lambda square over lambda. So again, linear response just means that the, the, uh, this function is, uh, is the same, independent of lambda. So your question really is to what degree this is true? this is possible. In other words, somehow, something smaller than certain value. I know you can use lambda, or if you know, uh, you can also use epsilon. They are related this way, according to what we learned long time ago, the Hanke strand, this is Hanke strand. Just a matter of showing the degree of of shape change, okay? Right. So, uh, so it is conceivable. In fact, uh, I came with the understanding that this is always true. That there is a finite value for this and this, below which this is true, that, uh, which really just says that the stress response uh, is linear in the deformation. And in that range, you can choose different values and get a universal relaxation modulus, this is called. This is called equilibrium, if you like, equilibrium relaxation modulus. In fact, it's a shear modulus, if you like. G stands for shear. So I, 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 this is uh, quite uh, uh, fine. What, uh, what, what get this topic started was something else, was the tube model. So let's take a look at the tube model. Uh, I know this will be perhaps only second time I'm trying to go in some details about the tube model. The tube model, if you like, was to say that there is a tube that can finally orient, okay? Uh, as you sh as you sh uh, as you uh, either shear or extend, this uh, chain goes to there. The the tube will become a little more aligned, whatever you want to call it. Deform. And then, one of the key assumptions of the tube model is Rouse chain retraction. In other words, the chain is enslaved by the tube 
it will deform, do whatever. But by the time of reaching tau r during relaxation, the chain will retract. The chain will retract. So it, it, the chain may become like that now. Okay? Instead of, instead of the, sorry, instead of the, the black chain before. Okay, that's the concept. Upon doing so, you necessarily lose stress. Lose stress, the, the part due to chain stretching. So, uh, so it turns out, uh, the, the, the bottom line is, this is assumed to occur no matter what is the strength. It does not matter it's above or below the magnitude. Which means, in simple terms, uh, this is something quite, quite crucial, which means according to the tube model, so, of course, this, if you like, uh, all this uh, means is it defines, I'm just rewriting it in the case of shear. Let me just rewrite it in the case of shear. According to the two model. And, um, Uh, you can. You, I, I, let me try to see if I use the diff, some symbols or not. This is why I'm a kind of. Uh, I, I know what I'm doing, but just uh, want to make sure that I can give you that later the the uh, The, um, the, the, the symbols that, that we used before or used in the, in the book. So I see I'm uh, looking for something like the damping function. Uh, basically, uh, in, in the book, we are examining this parameters, this function. So according to the uh, two model, no matter what is the uh, step strength, there will be a loss of stress at tau r due to chain retraction. What this means, at any gamma, what this means is that this is never a constant. Unlike what we just proposed here, that, that at a small strand, that this uh, uh, G should approach a constant independent of gamma. And uh, uh, what uh, was, uh, so I, I'm not going to go through a great deal of details, but rather showing you, I, I know I didn't uh, have this on the, uh, on the slides, so I'm going to draw it by hand. So what we were looking for, to, what we are trying to answer is whether is this number finite? That's really the question. Yeah, the, when I say finite, 
uh, it's not a infinitesimally small number. So what, so that our rheometer can still uh, make a determination. So what we uh, can do is to use different gammas. Gamma equals nearly zero, point two, point three, all the way, and see and see this function g whether they are all falling onto the same onto the same uh, line or not. Okay, different gammas. So what was plotted in uh, figure I want to say figure figure uh, fourteen point four. Uh, I, I think it's sorry. I think it's uh, probably best to to show that figure. Better to use the figures here. Okay, so here we here is one of such figures. You patiently try to uh, use different gamma, and you show indeed up to sixty percent. The relaxation behavior is independent of the uh, the amplitude you used. Okay, and. Uh, uh, this is an additional figure showing uh, by the time, I know this is a bit uh, 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 hard to, uh, for you to uh, appreciate more. Uh, basically, you can, see, let me just guide your eyes. 10% deformation, that's the top red line. And by the time you deformed uh, 110%, Gamma equals 1.1, that's this black one, okay? So you can see uh, gradually that there is the response, the stress response in terms of relaxation become quickened, you know, by the time of 110%, it is relaxing a little faster. And 80% uh, uh, is this orange, this kind of, can you see? actually, this is not bad. 80% is this orange one. I know it's actually not so easy for you to see. And 70% is that blue, uh, the green one. 70% is nearly perfectly on top of the red one. Okay? So what you can conclude are the fact that there is a region where below 70%, for example, the relaxation behavior are identical. And the same with the uh, extension. You can extend 20%, 30%, uh, 50% is almost the same as linear response. And by the time you extend about 70%, uh, you can barely start to see some deviations between uh, the between the, the low lambda and high lambda. This is our all step strand experiment. So you can summarize these results in the following two figures. And this is what we have done. Uh, if you normalize this uh, relaxation behavior with the equilibrium relaxation behavior at long times, then you find the open circles, uh, open symbols are the experiments. Okay? The open symbols are experiments. All you need to know is more or less different symbols means uh, a relaxation at different times, either five rows time or ten rows time. You're basically reading. You're basically reading this relaxation behavior at 
five rows time, one rows time is here, five rows time is here, ten rows time is here, and you read how much uh, faster it becomes. And the faster ones are the ones that's below the line of unity. So you can see, roughly speaking, up to 60%, there was no change in the relaxation behavior. Beyond 60%, the relaxation is faster the larger the gamma you use. Okay. So it seems phenomenologically we, one can identify a region of linear response, a gigantic region, experimentally detectable, about 60%, 0.6 H to the right. Uh, the relaxation behavior are nearly identical. Uh, and obviously, there's no uh, motion during this period, uh, during such uh, experiments. And the solid line are the theory. Okay? As I try to indicate, the theory anticipate that the chain retraction, Rouse chain retraction will always occur, which means as soon as you waited for Rouse time, certain uh, stress will be lost due to chain stretching. And of course, the, lo the amount of loss is greater if you stretch it more. So there's a smooth line going from one and deviating downward. By the time of 60%, the two model predict that you should lose about 15% of stress, which is not observed experimentally. Experimental uncertainty is 2 or 3%. So this 15% change is, uh, is gigantic. It's very noticeable. Okay. So, uh, same with, uh, same with, uh, huh. You see, I was looking for typos. Here is one. God, I cannot believe it. This should be lambda. Here's one of the very few I, 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 I'm aware of in the book. So this is extension. Uh, the second curve is for extension. Uh, it have a similar story. You can extend your sample about uh, 50%. The relaxation behavior is the same as you extending only 10% or 20%. But according to the two model, it, they should ha you should uh, uh, you should uh, see a big difference between uh, extending 50% versus very little. And that is not experimentally observed. So this is, this is the theoretical line, the solid symbol, the open symbol of the experiment. So at least phenomenologically, we are uh, indicating that uh, there is cohesion. So this, this whole uh, chapter is about finite cohesion. So it appears to us, of course, you may develop, try to develop a theory about it, but basically, it appears to us uh, your entangled polymer is, is not so fragile, if you like. In other words, it has, it has certain robustness. It has certain cohesion. Once the chains establish entanglement, it likes to stay entangled without breaking apart. And, and uh, 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 if you speak more directly, there is, uh, is to say there is no evidence that, that there is any uh, fast relaxation process, such as Rao's chain retraction, that produces, uh, that destroys linear response. Linear response means the relaxation behavior is independent of the applied strength. And we find a window about 50 to 60 percent, OK? We find a window of linear response, a sizable window, sizable range of linear response. That's the conclusion. Whereas according to the tube model, the linear response is, is what? 
en femme à ce mot. According to the two models, there is no linear response region. So this is a gigantic, uh, 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 different uh, conclusion from uh, you know the two model has a very different conclusion than what we could conclude from experiment. Um, well, I, 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 this uh, part of the phenomenology does provide some uh, background for the theory that uh, we want to speak about. So perhaps uh, you will remember by the time we start to speak about the theory, about this finite cohesion and what it means theoretically. So uh, the, uh, this chapter has a, a, a ending part that is somewhat uh, interesting, in, in my opinion, which is this. So for example, if I have, uh, so I'm just going to briefly mention it before we move on. So it's talking about long chain branching. Okay, for polymer, for people who are interested in the chemistry part uh, and architecture part, here is, in fact, the first time I speak about chain architecture. So if you only have linear chains, uh, our previous uh, experiment shows, for example, if you, uh, if you step extend your sample by a factor of two, it will break. It will undergo elastic uh, yielding. And in fact, localized elastic yielding, so it actually will break. But when you have long chain branching, okay, according to the data, even if you stretch to lambda of 2.7, the uh, uh, sample uh, stays intact. It doesn't break. Okay, so so there is something interesting about the fact when you have uh, long chain branching somehow you had a higher uh, cohesion. In other words, the long chain branching somehow provides uh, additional cohesion. Uh, any good theory will presumably have to build this part of the uh, phenomenology into, into consideration. Okay. So this is a really uh, all I have to say about uh, this very short uh, chapter 14. We speak about, basically in this 14, about finite cohesion, about the fact there is a sizable uh, linear response range. When we see range, of course, that's the range in strength. Okay. Okay, so uh, I plan to move on uh, to the last topic. And so what I hope to do was uh, uh, perhaps in the next class, I will try to make some reviews before we uh, go to the final phase, uh, start to talk about the theory. So uh, that theory basically uh, 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 is, is content in, in part four. So we're, we're really reaching the final part, part four. And uh, um, so it, part four, it, it carries the title of, uh, uh, if you like, it's about what's really coming, so emergent, a new framework, if you like. For, for understanding what we have observed so far. Um, 
I will start with uh, something uh, more straightforward in chapter 15. So this basically will introduce us into, or basically it uh, supplement what we have said so far. So uh, we will start gently with a chapter, uh, also very short, uh, on homogeneous. On homogeneous uh, 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 entanglement, if you like, or disentanglement, either way. So, this is, uh, I'm just going to gently reach uh, for you a, 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 a very difficult point, that is entanglement. So I'm going to start to say something very seriously about entanglement now. Um, it, it, the, the word emerges a long time ago in the 50s at least. And uh, one can uh, think about entanglement in many ways. For example, we know viscosity as function of molecular weight, all of a sudden uh, become very sharply, sensibly dependent on molecular weight beyond certain uh, critical molecular weight. And this feature is often uh, known to, do, to be due to entanglement. And entanglement, as I said, really carry very many meanings, and for many people, they all mean very different things. And in, in particular, it will be confusing for you in the literature because this word is also used. This word of entanglement is also heavily used when your polymer is in solid state. That's just a, a little bit too much, uh, per se. Meaning, uh, I think it's useful, or useful, it's necessary for us to know what we mean by entanglement. So solid state, of course, means T is either you are in the glassy state below Tg, or you are in a semi-crystalline state Uh, below TC, those are the solid state. I, I, I think it's beneficial for us first to speak about entanglement liquid state. That, of course, means above TG and above TM melting. So it is easier to talk about it because we know at least we know that is a disordered state where we don't have to worry about morphology per se. At least uh, uh, large-scale morphology is absent. In this so-called liquid state, we, of course, we are familiar with as the melt state. And for semi-crystalline polymers, you can call it the molten state. Right? Uh, basically, it's a, a liquid state. In this liquid state, what do we mean by entanglement? What is its effect? Is a central question. In fact, let me one more time rephrase the core questions in rheology. For how long does entanglement survive, right? Either during startup or step strand. So I, I'm rephrasing my two core questions. I could use the language of entanglement to say the same thing. And then the question two is, when does disentanglement takes place, or take place, because I already have the, the 
right? Again, in either st uh, uh, startup or step strand. So that's the question. Remember, the previously we phrased these two questions in terms of when do you have elastic deformation or when do you have affine deformation and when affine deformation ceases to occur. And now let's speak about the same two questions using a structural language called entanglement. So if I phrase this question for you, remember this two question is what this whole book addresses. Okay, this entire book. So if I speak in this language, I better tell you what is entanglement, according to, uh, according to its real logical effects, meaning what entanglement means real logically. So uh, so there are obviously two things you can do. Uh, but by that uh, entanglement, uh, another way to say is, uh, how can you uh, uh, treat it analytically or, or mathematically or, or, or conceptually? Well, there is the two model speaking about entanglement. Or, instead of saying that, more careful way would be that describes the effect of entanglement, right? That would be that would be another way of saying it, which we start to talk about. How does two model treat entanglement? Well. You know how at least it uh, attempts to treat it. It attempts to treat it by saying, by acknowledging, oh, look at any chains. The presence of other chains provide a tube-like constraint. Okay, this is the effect. This is the effect of entanglement, if you like. So what is entanglement? Well, this is the effect of entanglement. The entanglement, of course, is something due to, so, a language, I think, even two model will not disagree, is entanglement, you know, I, I, you can see I'm dancing around intentionally. Instead of giving you a definition of entanglement, I start to say, oh, what produces entanglement? So I can say, entanglement arises from inter chain on crossability. Uh, you can say, as I said, two model does not object to this statement, but two model uh, are not sufficiently explicit in capturing what uh, this uh, uh, uncrossability means and does. So, as I said, if you ask anyone, they will give you a, a different way of what entanglement is. And for me, it is this. So what is uh, uh, entanglement? It is, uh, st structurally speaking, it is a elastic, obviously it's a chain network, due to uh, uncrossability. We know its effect. It, 
effect is to enable elastic deformation. On certain time scales. So since I already have uh, that set, I, gee, I of course don't need that elastic word there anymore. I can say it's just a, that's what the entanglement is. It speaks about a uh, structure or chain network that uh, because of it, because of the structure, or rather that structure is elastic. So there are so many ways to say the same thing. Okay. Uh, of course, you may say that enables uh, elastic uh, deformation before its failure due to whatever that you now today should have some ideas because we have spoke about its failure all the time, ever since shear bending. So if you like, we are in the, we, we, we have begun to refine our language and to speak about how long can entanglement last, and when it start to fail due to disentanglement? That's the question. It's a million dollar question because all the hundred, several hundred million pounds of polymers during processing uh, confronts this question, these questions. Any question on this? So this is what uh, I would carefully define as entanglement. And of course, we have yet to talk about what is disentanglement. But be my guest, you can already start to think about how a fine deformation might take place. How a fine deformation might take place. Well, it's of course, is counting on on cross-usability, right? And also counting on the fact the red chain relative to the black chains do not rapidate, do not swim away fast, right? Because if it escapes, then of course you have no way of changing that red chain's conformations. So it must not have escaped when, you, you, when you're trying to uh, uh, cause that red chain to be deformed. So, uh, so this is the 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 whole. Uh, uh, the only thing I have yet to to impress you is this unit, as you know, repeats. You know, if you have a sample that's. Uh, uh, let me first tell you. This unit is about, uh, generally speaking, several. You have done the homework. So it's basically, let's say, uh, 30 nano. Uh, did I say? I, I keep, I keep, uh, I need to watch my. Thir 30 nanometers. Let me try to be sure. I think I am right because uh, uh, the cone lens is essentially on the one nanometer scale. And the entanglement lens is essentially, that's in your homework. Okay? So, I think I am. Uh, I think I am often, <laughs> this is, of course, not something for me to forget. Uh, I think they are in the range of five nanometers.
Yeah. You know how I convinced myself? It's all in your homework. Between entanglement, the stretching you can achieve is exactly this number. Okay? And I firmly remember this number is on the order of four or five. Okay. So that, that, that we are all there now. Different polymers are different. So there's a range from three to five or three to eight, in fact, nanometers. That's a typical range for one unit. Okay? So, of course, your sample, your sample could be 10 millimeters. And you know how many units it involves. Over a million. That's all. Over a million of such units. They are all connected one to another. Over a, a million. That's just a one-dimensional sense. Because of course, this thing is three-dimensional. The reason I emphasize this is for you to think about the following magic that we have dealt with throughout. The magic of how you can have shear bending. And when we, I speak about shear bending, I keep, I keep speaking about the fact, that, let me remind you what is shear bending. So. So this will be in absence of shear bonding, okay? Just like the black lines, which means uh, velocity here is here, that is that, that is that, linearly changing across the gap. Shear bonding, take a, uh, a illustration. Could mean something like this, okay? What it should uh, be clear to you is it means this layer shared very little. And this layer shared a lot. OK? That's what it means. Huh? That's shear bonding. So there will be a layer here at the bottom that shared a great deal, and another three quarters of the layer Shear very little. I keep telling you that in either layer, sigma 1 or sigma 2, in either layer, the stress is the same. And you be my guest. Think about what this means. The stress is the same. They are sharing very differently what happened to the state of entanglement. Suppose you even had this in steady state. Yeah, I showed you movies where the system just keeps being sheared like this uh, at long times. Okay? So uh, think about how these two different states can coexist. What I just want to make it up for you is a topic I mentioned in chapter, I described in chapter four, where I talked about homogeneous deformation and talked about an argument about absence of shear bending. So let me make that argument for you here. First of all, I can claim that every layer have the same stress. And to do that is really to make the following argument. For example, if you take this layer that I depicted here, OK? 
Okay? You ask yourself whether that layer uh, accelerates or not. Well, it turns out it hardly accelerates uh, because uh, because uh, the acceleration uh, dies away very quickly. So in, in, in steady state, there is no... So I'm just trying to flip to you the, the formula number. So this is the equation 4.1b. There is no acceleration, okay, which implies that this is a constant. Sorry, which implies sigma is a constant because this is uh, the derivative. It doesn't change in the directions, so sigma is constant. So this is to me. So for you to understand, it's very simple. The stress, shear stress acting on the bottom surface, is the same as shear stress on the top surface. That's why the net force is zero. There's no force acting on that layer. So since, uh, since this involves different y's, I'm just saying the stress doesn't change when you move along y. So when sigma is constant, I can make an argument, very bad argument. I can make an argument if sigma is constant, gamma dot is also constant. which means no shear bending. Okay, an argument is very simple. If, if all you need is to be able to argue that the relationship between stress and shear rate is, mon is one to one, there's a one to one correspondence. So if, uh, uh, So if sigma is a function of shear rate, then if there is one-to-one -one correspondence, then gamma dot is a function of sigma. Sorry, let, let, let me just simplify it. It's an inverse function of, of f. So, it's a, so if a sigma is constant, then gamma dot is also constant. So that's the argument. Gamma dot is constant means this is true. Same shear rate everywhere. So in chapter four, I try to misguide, quote unquote, the reader by thinking, by, uh, by, by, uh, 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 trying to tell them that uh, it seems like since the shear stress is the same every, at every layer, the shear rate should be the same as well. Because it, if this function is invertible. So mathematically, uh, the, the flaw of the argument is clearly in here that it's not invertible. That, and you know this is not invertible if there's a, a maximum or if, there's a, if it turns flat, then, right? By definition, if it turns flat, for one sigma, there will be many gamma dots, right? By definition, if my curve is flat. So in other words, when you have shear bending, you are being reminded that perhaps that perhaps different states can coexist. And which means what? Which means for different shear rate, they all have the same stress. And this is what it is when you have shear bending. So, 
So I'm, we are at the stage trying to understand the idea that, uh, that, uh, a untangled polymer could adopt different degrees of entanglement interactions such that they still uh, exhibit the same amount of stress. So obviously, conceivably, if we are looking at the, the layer here, the chains may be uh, what you want to call what do you want to call, much loosely interacting than, than the chains here that are, still, that are still highly entangled somehow. It's up to you to speculate because I have done all my speculation. I couldn't go much more than that. So somehow, The f complexity, the fact there are a million layers across a tiny sample, uh, afford them all the possible ways to arrange among themselves. I mean, of course, I think uh, uh, I, I should uh, actually uh, not confuse you by not speaking about the sixth system in this dimension. I should try to convince you the system in this dimension which is about a millimeter, the gap dimension, right? Because it's the different, different height that we're talking about different state of entanglement in the case of shear. Of course, in the extension case, I can speak about several centimeters or several millimeters. Uh, in any event, uh, I'm uh, very slowly trying to get you to uh, think about uh, a initially very homogeneously uh, intermingled system. In other words, homogeneous at the level of 10 nanometers. Um, how does such a homogeneous system meet the fate of of, uh, uh, of destruction, of uh, having to be sheared or extended beyond their limits of tolerance. So how do they, you know, deal with the fact? Uh, the fact, I think, is something, I, I, let me repeat again and again. The fact is something of this, that we're talking about this limit. Right? What is this limit? Let's, let's, uh, in fact, uh, uh, before we talk about theory, I will also try to review for you again. But let's for a moment speak about this limit again. What is this limit? Well, write down it again. Wi is nothing but tau over the time it takes to make 100% deformation. That's what it is. In the case of shear, it's shear rate. In the case of extension, it's Hanke rate. But basically, T is 1 over the gamma dot, or 1 over the epsilon dot, such that T basically is the time to make 100% deformation in shear, or to make one Hanke strand which, of course, as you know, corresponds to lambda equals 2.7. Still, that's, it's, it's fine. It's basically, we're talking about either sharing just one edge to the right, how long it takes, right? Or a sample that's just being extended to 2.7 of its initial length, how long it takes. That's T1, yeah? Right? Okay, that's T1. And WI simply means within the equilibrium relaxation time over which the chains diffuse around, 
It takes time to In that amount of time, how many T1s occurred? Right? How many T1s are in tau? Because each T1 is 100% deformation. Right? So if WI is 100, which is not outrageous, unreasonable during processing, it means your tau is 100 T1s, which means if you wait for the chance to diffuse, I would have moved my H 100 times to the right. Does your entanglement, can your, entang uh, your entanglement bear that consequence? <laughs> if I knew this question 20 years ago or 30 years ago, I, I would start to become uh, intrigued by it. My God, how can the system do that? At the WI of 100, how can my structure, whatever I'm able to depict here, how can my structure, this entanglement, this thing I carefully define as entanglement, how can this network, or what should this network respond if I try to, within my relaxation time, to shear 100 edge to the right, or to stretch my length by a factor of several hundred. How, 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 what, what, do you, what do you see? What do you expect to see? I mean, since this picture is nothing, look, folks, this picture is not my invention. It's nothing new. This picture existed in people's head since 50s, at least. We knew this picture. Let me just say something very dramatic here. We knew this picture, but we did not know how such a picture will produce for you. 3.4 power, for example. We knew that picture, for sure, right? without question. Why? Because we know our, our untangled melt behave like a crosslink rubber. So we know there is uncrossability that produces everything. We call it physical entanglement. We further know that's happened at high molecular weight. We further know when that happens, it produces this dramatic, uh, strong dependence of viscosity on the chain lines. We know that in the 50s. We know this picture in the 50s. It takes the gene, right? It takes the gene in 71 to come up with the explanation of the 3.4 by the idea of reptation, right? By the way, that was a tube model concept. But there's a big but here. This problem is a linear response problem, OK? Can you appreciate that or not? This is determined in the so-called zero rate limit. What that means? Wi much smaller than one limit. No shear thinning. Linear response. Uh, entanglement remain intact. It's in that limit. Where the concept of the tube to describe its rheological consequence is apparently okay. Because the tube is not going to get destroyed. Because you are in this limit. The chains happily swim from tube to tube. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. So this is a tremendous advancement to get the linear response part done through the tube model. Well, at that time, we wouldn't even call it tube model. It was just borrowing the idea of 
Edward, who had the notion of the tube and plasmaless reputation. Edward's tube, plasmaless reputation. When we speak about tube model, we speak about a subsequent four papers by Doy and Edwards. That uh, uh, gave a much more detailed account of the polymer dynamics, as well as nonlinear response, which is in the last paper four, in 79. So, uh, so I think we are having a very good starting point here. Uh, I'm uh, indicating to you uh, how we are thinking about entanglement, and I'm, think, uh, I'm indicating to you how, um, how, uh, how important to appreciate in this WI much larger than one limit how this structure can respond. And that's all there is. If I threw this question to you you, you, you would immediately start to solve it. In other words, you would say, Jesus, how can this structure survive? It must not survive. Because you're stretching too fast. It, it, look, this is my PDMS. It doesn't survive. I mean, I, I'm a little bit embarrassed. This PDMS in front of my hand. Who doesn't know this? I'm sure everyone knows this in the 50s. In the 1950s. In the t as soon, you can go back and find out when we start to have high molecular weight polydimethylsiloxane. As soon as you get, have that, I know this dirty now, it should be transparent, a beautiful piece of sample, uncrosslink, PDMS, that has a TG of minus 100 degrees C, high molecular weight, tau is several seconds, but since I can stretch much faster than several seconds, look, my entanglement network is falling apart. In other words, it seems a big part of the discussion of rheology of polymers should be to address how this entanglement network falls apart. Falls apart often, in this case, means uh, unable to undergo homogeneous deformation. Or the word we use so many times, strand. Localization. So we'll pick up from, from this point on next time. We're done today.